what's going on, y'all. And thanks again so much for joining us here on Expanded Perspectives with me, Cam Hale. And of course, as always, it's me, amigo, Big Fizzy. How's it going, everybody? Yes, I'm here in Skeleton Studios. Woo-hoo. Excited about this one. Halloween is almost here, y'all. But I we, can't ooh, wait. We've been busy. This been, has been a thing coming. <laughs> Very busy, uh, you know, not just with normal work, but getting ready for the live show yeah. coming up uh, this Friday. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, I think. Uh, it's not going to be like a ton of presentations. It's mostly going to be people getting the chance to meet me and you. And tell <clears throat> stories. Share stories. It's that time of year. And uh, let's not forget, the place we're going, y'all, is haunted. That's true. There's a lot of haunt. I got to talk to y'all about all the hauntings and a few things that happened. And I'm talking physical encounters. People have had physical encounters there, so it's going to be. But yeah, it's it's not a big presentation thing. It's just stories and laughs and firsthand encounters. And there's going to be like a costume contest. I think there's going to be a DJ there. Yeah, they're, there's going to do a costume contest for adults, for the kids, and for pets. Oh, right. Yeah, and we found too. There's it's fifteen bucks to get in. They're going to have a gl- a pint glass, like a souvenir. Yeah, and you get three beers with it. Right. Me and you aren't making any money. No, off of but I'm going to drink some, some, can, some pints of beers. So. Oh, I'm already got my first one I'm getting is Hazy Cat. <laughs> oh, that's because I have about. Hazel Cat. Remember that's the one, right. the cat that used to hang out at the old Skeleton Studios? We took her home. She's been at my house since. Hazy Cat. I mean, that's an awesome shirt. I'm going to have to get, I saw one we were over well, there. I showed you the other day that that's what I put you in in my phone as. <laughs> oh, I did not know that. <laughs> yeah. But that doesn't surprise yeah, it's me. it's Hazy Cat. Right? What does surprise me is I think... Luke is going to be Jason Voorhees. Nice. Although the other day he came home with these elf ears that just go on. So I don't know if he was planning to be an elf. Like two days ago he showed me that. And I said, well, if he don't use them, I'll just wear them to D&D. Next time I'm Talos, <laughs> That's right. just wear my elf ears. <laughs> That's right. Right? There you go. What have you been up to, man? Man, oh man. Nothing really. I've been, uh, did a little work, been working and, and been hanging out with my granddaughter and then getting all the stuff ready so I can go do some filming here pretty quick. So. That's right. You are going uh, on a hunt. Yeah, where I went last year, I'm going to go back up into Colorado and Kansas. <clears throat> we'll Sorry, y'all. up there with the guys from the Stickbow Chronicles. Blake from the Stickbow Chronicles will go up there with him, and then I'll go up there, too, with Tony Tretch. So if any of y'all are into the hunting and all that stuff, you'll know those guys and all that. So we'll go back up. Same guys I was with last year. That sounds— And I think Bill the, uh, from Iron Will Outfitters, the guy that owns Iron Will, I think Bill's going to be there and another guy's coming with him. So I think there's going to be a few of us. That's cool. It's going to get to pop in and visit and hang out. Well, so, speaking of hunting, uh, in the outro, I've got a story for some people when it comes to hunting. But before we get to that, let's just get into some sightings. What yeah. do you say, Brad? Let's do it. Check this one out. It says, I've been struggling with contacting you for weeks. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Maurice Spawn Sr. Some uh, people call me Maurice. Right. Uh, I live in... Anadarko, Oklahoma. I think that's how you say it. Sure. Sorry. Anadarko, Oklahoma, and I'm originally from San Diego. My first UFO encounter was around 1976. It's a good year. That's the year I was born. Me, my father and mother, and I moved from San Diego to Spring Valley. My mother worked nights as a nurse for Mercy Hospital downtown, usually from 10 p.m. till 8 a.m. One night after we dropped my mother off at work, we did our usual nighttime routine and stopped by Taco Bell. On the way home, going east, I spotted an out object, I'm sorry, outside of my window facing south. It appeared to be a white orb-like object just above the hills following us on a horizontal course. I pointed at it to my father, who at first thought I was joking or making up something. When he saw it, I could tell he became afraid. Know a little bit about my father. He was around six foot eight and the toughest man alive. I never saw him afraid of anything. We continued on our way home, both of us looking at the object, which climbed out of view into the sky. We quickly went home and rushed into the house, my father leading the way by unlocking the door. We set our food on the railing and I closed the door when the doorbell rang. I thought it was one of my father's friends who on occasion would stop by after and after we took my mom to work. I quickly opened the door over the protest of my father and saw a being standing in front of our door and a white glowing disc-like craft over our street. Bear with me on this. The being had the head of a male lion and black robes with stars, galaxies, and comets on it. But the strange thing was that the objects on the robe were moving. 
the spiral galaxies swirling, comets shooting, stars twinkling. Then the lion-headed being roared at me and my father, fell backwards towards the floor, and everything went black. My mother found us the next day in the hallway with the front door open and me and my father sound asleep on the floor. She woke us up yelling like, what were y'all doing and why the heck I didn't go to school? I tried to explain what we saw last night and what happened, but my father told me to be quiet. No being a child of the 70s, no, now being a child of the 70s, I knew not to disobey my father and attempted to tell my mother later after school why my father was at work. I will give my mother credit. She listened, but I don't think she believed me. Then, in 1985, I was 15 and living in El Reno, Oklahoma. A bunch of friends and I were leaving a friend of ours' house, and by a bunch, I mean about 15 to 18 guys. It was around 8 p.m. at night, and we were going to Booker T. Washington's gym to play basketball. When an object fell out of the sky from the south heading to the north, the object was making a buzzing noise, almost like a helicopter, but louder. We all looked up and saw a large ball of light about 20 feet in diameter falling out of the sky. It smelled like sulfur. It was changing colors from white to yellow, green, blue, and red, then back to white. It looked like it was landing or crashing at the neighborhood park about 10 blocks away. One of the guys looked at me and suggested that we go see what it was. The reason he looked at me as well because I was into science, and jokingly, they called me the professor. Science! I got a sudden feeling of dread thinking about investigating the object, and I said no. Everyone shrugged, and we went on to play basketball. Now, my biggest encounter was in 1991. I was in the Oklahoma National Guard. A new father and the first Iraq war was on, and I was waiting to be deployed. I, bought the new year, I brought the new year in with my child and my girlfriend, and since they stayed at her mother's house, I had to leave. It was between 1 and 1.30 a.m. I was walking across the band field towards the home when I saw an object to the northwest. It looked like a star with a trail streaming from it and white objects falling towards the ground. At first, I thought it was the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then I remembered he comes from the east. So my next thought was that the Russians had launched missiles, and that was it. Tinker Air Force Base is about 25 miles from El Reno. Stuck with indecision about should I warn my mother and little brother or my girlfriend and child, I just stood there watching. The object was coming closer still, with a tail and with objects falling to the ground. Then to two beams of light shot out in front of it, so I thought it was an airplane. I was feeling for the sorry for the people on the plane, though it was like a 747. I'd never seen a plane crash, and I continued watching. That's when the strangest thing happened. The headlights started sweeping the ground. I could tell that they were looking for a place to ditch. Then it occurred to me, when did 747s get searchlights? One beam of light went to the north and the other to the south, and then they both came together on me standing in the middle of the band field and went out. It was right in front of me when my sight came back. A UFO disc shaped with the back end blown off. Debris was falling off the back end towards the ground, but when it reached the ground, it just evaporated. The UFO was trailing smoke and it had a row of windows on the side. The lights inside the UFO were emergency red. And I swear I saw silhouettes of beings running back and forth. That's when one of them stopped and looked down at me. I thought to myself, here's my chance to make contact with someone from another planet. I had a mini flashlight on my keychain, and I flashed it up at him a couple of times with no response. So I waved my right arm, and it copied me. Then with both arms, and again, it copied me. I heard a vehicle stop on the street behind me and a man, and I was deeply concerned about his well-being. We stood there looking at each other for what felt like hours when another figure who was running past it stopped, looked down at me and grabbed my friend and went to the undamaged part of the craft. Just then, six balls of light, then a seventh, shot towards the southwest, all changing colors from white to yellow to green, blue, red, and then back to white. I ran home and woke my mother up frantically, telling her what I had just seen. Then to a party 
where I knew a friend of mine was, I told him and he thought I was full of it. But I convinced him to go to his house to watch the news. We were watching Channel 4 News when an anchor woman, Uzi Brown Washington, came on and said, if you saw an object in the sky, it was, and then she was cut off. All my friend could do was look at me with his mouth open. We stayed up until five that morning, waiting for her to come back on with the news of what I saw. I'm 52 years old, and I've only told this to a handful of people. I felt I could trust. Thank you for your time, Maurice C. Spawn Sr. Thanks, Maurice. Strange story. That is... The UFO was, you know, his last signing was damaged, and he said there was stuff dripping off of it. Reminds me of the guy we saw in Arkansas who had that fragment Mm -hmm. where he said him and his friend saw something dripping off of it. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, what about the Chimera wizard that put ever what are the you, sorcerer? You're talking about the Leonin? Yes. Yeah. The Leonin barbarian standing at his front door <laughs> with like the, the Fantasia robe on. What was that? Besides the coolest interaction with a, a creature that you could possibly have. Do you remember the movie Cocoon? Yes. Do you remember how the extraterrestrials in that movie, they really didn't have a shape or form. Mm-hmm. More light. Right. Do you think that these extraterrestrials that he saw like maybe it took on that form because somehow it could peer into his mind and it knew that he had seen, I don't know, bed knobs and broomsticks or like a cartoon or a lion or the, or like I said, the Mickey mouse robe, like, and it's trying to look like something it knows. You see, like, I wonder the same thing when it comes to dog man sightings, are these demons manifesting themselves because they can somehow tap your brain and they know that you've seen the howling. So it's trying to, it knows that scared you. It can tell that that's, that it had that emotion. So it's trying to copy something that it knows will scare you. You know, does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, I guess it could. Or yeah. does the extraterrestrial really look like a Leonin? Well, here's what I think about is I always think a about- A tabaxi. I mean, like, what are we talking about? About the of the way the creatures or the gods are, are drawn to look from Egyptian history. Oh, like Anubis and stuff? Why they look like that. And then why is it that their take on the same things that we were seeing now? Mm-hmm. Right. That's, yeah. Right. They, they maybe worshiped them as gods then and as now they've been cast aside. Like, what is it? You know what I'm saying? It's weird. Yeah. It, that is, dude, that's an awesome thing, though. It really, to see a, to, like you said, a Leonin with a sorcerer's robe swirling magic on and then wake up, you'd be like, wait a second. For those that don't know what a Leonin is, in D&D, there's a race <laughs> of lion people, and they're called Leonin. Yes. But, like, I've, you know, literally read thousands and thousands of UFO sightings. Mm-hmm. I've never heard of one where an extraterrestrial looked like a Leonin. No, no. In a wizard rope. So, very cool story. Yeah. Thank you. Extremely awesome. I got you one here I think you're going to dig right here. It says, my encounter occurred in a mountain gap on the edge of the Coosa River and in the Union Grove area of Chilton County, Alabama. Each happened in the same year, about two weeks apart in 2006. First was a tree knocking at around 11 a.m. while I was standing with my dad on the edge of a logging road walking back to the truck. The second was around 9 a.m. while my dad and I were skinning rabbits by a creek. Something threw rocks into the creek right beside us. Now, we hear that often, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And it says, at first, we thought it was a hunting buddy playing tricks until I saw a rock fly from behind a group of downed trees about 75 yards away. Now, get this, Philly. It says, the rock was as big as a one-gallon milk jug. I didn't realize these were encounters until I started listening to other people's stories. Well, the next encounter happened in 2008. I had just received my driver's license and hunting license, so I was able to hunt alone. Well, it was about an hour before sunlight when something screamed at me and I could tell it was clearly upset. It scared the hell out of me, so I turned around and started quickly walking back to my truck. Well, it followed me for about 700 yards all the way to my truck. Something kept on telling me to move faster, and I've never been so terrified in my entire life. Well, in 2009, I had my first and only sighting, and I put the puzzle pieces together. I set up on an edge of a two-year-old clear cut to see if I could catch a buck chasing does. At around 8.15 a.m., I saw two doe come running into the clear out of the the timberline at about 175 yards. So I got my gun up, ready, anticipating a buck chasing them. 
About 15 minutes later, I saw this weird-looking animal come out, kind of on all fours. And it was walking very strange. So I sat up in my seat to get a better view, and this thing stood up and looked right into my eyes. I was shocked. This Bigfoot had grayish-brown skin and dirty, blondish-brown hair. It was skinny and about five foot seven to six foot in height. I'm assuming it was a juvenile. Now, they're definitely not primates because it looked so human. Well, we stared at each other for around 30 seconds, and then it took off running, faster than anything I've ever seen. Well, I didn't wait around for it to disappear into the other wood line. The minute it was out of sight, I got down and retreated. Now, over the past few years, I've heard crazy screams, yells, and even wood knocks behind the house. But luckily, that's all. And I do not wish to have any more of these face-to-face encounters. Yeah, I don't blame you. So that's pretty dog. But see, again, we hear this all the time. And like we've talked about before, lots of people talk about having a firearm with them when they see them and still never shoot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, You're many times. Right at them. And that comment, they don't, they're not as primate-ish as you think. They look more like a human being. Yeah, like a Denisovan yeah, or whatever. So. Yeah, yeah. So there's that. <laughs> uh, I know you're a big fan of the melon heads. Yeah, oh, yeah. Check this out. This person has a real life sighting uh, of a melon head. Oh, all right. It says, hello, gentlemen. I'm from a rural area of Connecticut. Now, despite what many people think, Connecticut is densely forested, and most of the state outside the big cities is farmland and forest. We have tons of local legends around here, and it can be a really creepy place. Now, he's not wrong about being forested. I mean, like New Jersey is like the biggest deposit of black bear in the whole U.S. Like there's more black bear in New Jersey than any other state. Yeah, they're crawling up like red ants through that place. And it's a small state. So like much like, you know, Connecticut's even smaller. But yeah, that's it's a lot of forested people. When they think of New York, Connecticut, they think of New York City. They don't realize yeah. that New York's a really big state. I think it's like the fourth largest state in the U.S. And a lot of it is forest and farmland. Yeah. When you get away from the island. Yeah, when you get away from the island. So one of the most popular legends around here is that of the melon heads, a deformed inbred group of people living in the woods, which began when a number of mental patients either escaped or were abandoned. Those are my cousins. I believe it. I was hanging around with some friends that night. The story got brought up and I felt as if it was worth relaying a group of us from our side of town, were hanging around at a friend's house down the road from where most of us lived. The family had an old cellar in the backyard. There was a staircase that went down to a small room where they kept two big lay-down ice boxes. They had used these to store meat in, game, livestock, whatever. Their youngest son, Kyle, was around 10 at the time. The rest of us were ranging from 10 to 14 years old. He had wandered out to the backyard and had been playing with sticks or something. For whatever reason, he eventually made his way over to that old cellar and decided to go down. When he got to the bottom of the stairs, a grotesque figure leaned up from one of the ice boxes and turned to look at him. He described it as something like Quasimodo or sloth from the Goonies combined. And this guy was eating raw meat from one of the ice boxes. Kyle said he was too scared to scream, and when he ran back up the stairs, he struggled with the door for a moment. When he looked back, the freakish man had started towards him. When he finally made it out of the cellar and came running inside, he was crying and white as a ghost. We went out back with his father, and nobody was in the cellar. But the meat in the cooler had definitely been disturbed. Kyle isn't and wasn't an imaginative kid, to say the least. I know for a fact that something weird happened that day. Was it some super freaky at the time? Yes. And I still, I wonder what happened. What happened to bring it up on some dark night down a dirt road? Peace and love, Mike from Connecticut. Wow, Mike. I mean, what are the chances of having a melon head encounter? What was down there in that what was cellar that? eating meat? Tried to scare the kid. Like, even if the kid had it an worked. overactive imagination, and it really wasn't a melon head, right? He was freaked out. When they went back there later, the icebox was open and the meat had been eaten. Mm-hmm. So something bipedal yeah. was in there eating and trying to chase the kid. So it looked like 
a cross between sloth and Quasimodo. What the heck? I don't know. Again, it makes me think of that one that we talked about, the, that one episode of all the inbreeding uh, in the X-Files. Yeah, it was a great episode. Things. Yeah, those, that thing's disturbing. It's a great episode. Well, let's take a break, folks. When we get back from the break, I'm going to be talking about some missing people. Stick with us, folks. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. And we're back with Expanded Perspectives. Yeah, um, one of the most popular subjects that we cover on the show are those of missing people. Uh, for, you know, me included, it's very interesting uh, some of the circumstances that go into whenever these people go missing, whether they're children, whether they're adults, it doesn't seem to matter. Uh, but more intriguing than not are the ones that are experienced hikers. Uh, hunters. We've done several episodes on missing hunters. Uh, that's close to my heart because I've grown up in the woods as a hunter my entire life. The same with Cam. Um, so it is baffling how these experienced outdoorsmen somehow make a mistake that they just wouldn't seem plausible. Sometimes they even are armed. So like what is happening to these people? I mean, of course, fatal accidents, they can happen very easily to even some of the most experienced of hikers and climbers and hunters. Because in the wilderness, it's not that hard to get lost. A couple of wrong turns and you could be lost immediately, unable to know which direction to proceed in. And very quickly, panic or hypothermia can begin to set in. You could slip on a rock or trip near a crevasse. And death or serious accidents can come quickly, especially when you're way off the beaten path. One, say, falling into a creek or a ravine or between a pile of rocks, you know, a body, dead or injured, can easily be hidden from search parties. However, when highly trained tracking dogs and professional search and rescue teams, you know, often using like FLIR, forward-looking infrared equipment, you know, to detect a person's body, then they still can't find them. Those are the, those are the ones that I find most intriguing. Sometimes they they scour an area for days and then they'll find the body in a spot that was previously searched. It like literally doesn't make any sense. Uh, of course, some of the people that go missing are probably, you know, were attacked by natural predators because let's not pretend that a lot of these places where people go missing, there are mountain lions, there are, you know, bears, whether black or brown. And so, of course, those kind of things can happen. But... Sometimes when they go missing, there's no, there's no evidence of an attack. Uh, predators, you know, if they were to attack someone, say they killed them, well, they would have to drag the body off. So there would be drag marks. There would be blood. There would be ta- torn or tattered clothing. Like some of these people, they just disappear. And that's it. They just go into the woods and they're never seen again. And so it's really bizarre how to explain what happened. I've got a couple today uh, I'd like to share with y'all, and so let's begin. In June 2011, a Dr. Michael Van Gortler and his daughter, 20-year-old McKenna, had gone to San Isabel National Forest in Colorado to go for a hike. Dr. Michael was a 53-year-old ER physician, and his daughter was studying medicine at the University of Colorado. They had gone to Missouri Mountain on a day of clear and calm weather. This was not their first hike. In fact, they hiked together on many occasions, so you could say, yes, they were experts. The father and daughter were last heard from on June 21st when McKenna sent a text to her boyfriend telling him that she was going hiking up the mountain with her father. They were due back Two days later, her father was due to work in the emergency room in Boulder on the Sunday. By Tuesday, his ex-wife, McKenna's mother, had called the Chaffee County Sheriff's Office to report them missing. After failing to get hold of her daughter and her ex-husband, she became worried. Rescuers launched a massive five-day air and ground search after finding their vehicle parked at the mountain's trailhead. Their bodies, unfortunately, were found eight days later. 
their bodies were found in steep terrain, about 500 feet above the main trail, at an elevation of 12,000 feet on the northeast side of Missouri Mountain, within the forest. Chaffee County Sheriff W. Pete Palmer told Reuters, he said, it's very unclear how they died. Sheriff Palmer said it had been one of the most extensive search and rescue operations the county had ever done. Over 200 rescuers searched the mountain. The search lasted for five days and consisted of 18 search and rescue teams, each with their own set of dogs, the sheriff's office, the fire department, and two National Guard helicopters. A military helicopter pilot dropping off a ground search and rescue team spotted what looked like two bodies. The coroner later reported they both died from blunt force trauma to their head and neck. They had been found with catastrophic face and head injuries at the bottom of a cliff. The relatives told Seven News they were, it was like they were blown off of the cliff. Coroner Mr. Animus said the conditions of their bodies indicated that they died on the day they set out on their hike and added that no crime had been committed. Their deaths were ruled an accident. He said their injuries were not inconsistent with falling. Now, McKenna's aunt, Suzanne Katz, said Michael was an expert survivalist. He always prepared with water, fire building equipment, and food every time they hiked describing him as obsessive when it came to preparing for his hikes. She said he always made an exhaustive list of what to pack, including collapsible containers for the collection of rainwater. He even once published an article on how to find water sources in the backcountry. The doctor had taken his daughter out on hikes ever since she was a child. Now, McKenna's cousin, Nicole Box, told Seven News that they were very experienced hikers and added that they were both prepared for this climb. It was believed they had taken with them fire-starting equipment, water purifiers, and some dehydrated food. Interestingly, Sheriff Palmer said, It's a complete mystery that so many people took that trail and we hadn't heard a word of anyone seeing them. The last person to know to have seen them alive was around 11.30. On the 22nd, was a hiker named Jared Bird. He said, People are always up in the mountains, having a good time and hiking. It was a beautiful, nice day, and I just thought they were going to be out for a nice hike. But, I think in the future, I'm going to start warning people about being up on the mountain later in the day. You know, it just kind of goes to show that anything can happen in the mountains. After being described as obsessive, When it came to preparing adequately for his hikes to ensure his and his daughter's safety and health and having been hikers for so many years, doesn't it seem a bit odd that they both mysteriously fell off a cliff? I mean, how does that happen? I could see someone falling, slipping and falling. Absolutely. But what's the chances of both people, the father and the daughter, both experienced falling off the cliff? Now, these were people that not just were used to hiking, but hiking in this area. So they had to be aware of the cliff. They had to have known, you know, if it was slick or wet. I mean, they just would have been more cautious, right? But for both, it makes you wonder, did someone push them off? Did something push them off? I don't know. Again, it goes into the deep well of mysterious missing people. Check this one out. Trainee doctor Rachel Bagnall... 25 and her boyfriend, Jonathan Jett, 34, and an attache for government in Quebec, both disappeared while hiking in rugged terrain. The Vancouver residents vanished into thin air after they left for a two-day hike in the area around Canisope and Saxafrag Peaks in the mountains north of Pemberton on September 4, 2010. The trail itself passes through some amazing forest. Two days after they were expected back, authorities found Jet's car parked on the Spetch Creek Forest Service Road. A pair of sunglasses, believed to be the trainee doctors, were found shortly after. 
as five search and rescue crews were combing the back country for the couple, a team located a pair of sunglasses believed to belong to Bagnall, but no other clues turned up. Jet's four-door Toyota Echo contained his cell phone. Record shows that he made no calls after September 3rd. An extensive air and ground search was conducted for the hikers, involving helicopters working three at a time. Numerous search and rescue police teams also scoured the mountainous region, but there was no trace of them at all. Repeated searches of the area were believed to be in, but they turned up no evidence at all about where they could be. No backpacks, no tents, no nothing. Rachel was wearing a bright red and orange jacket. A relative said that the receipt for a newly purchased axe was found in their vehicle but they were unsure exactly what the other equipment the couple had with them. Tim Lee, who was helping coordinate the search effort, said, Our goal is we want to establish direction of travel. Jonathan Jett's father spent over a week in the Pemberton area, continuing to try and find any clues he could about what happened to his son and his son's girlfriend. Bank statements revealed their last purchase was made on Jett's card at the diner, Tim Horton's, on the morning of September 4th. That was the last time any digital trace of them could be found. Police searched their homes, hacked into their Facebook accounts, checked their cell phone records, searched their computers, and there were no red flags. There were no red flags raised anywhere. The families of the missing couple spent thousands upon thousands of dollars on private searches, including hiring a group of highly experienced mountain guides to survey the area in the hopes of finding evidence of their whereabouts. It was believed that they had sufficient water, food, and other supplies to last for two to three days that they would be gone. The Royal Mounted Canadian Police sent a request out to anyone hiking in the Cassiope Saxifrag areas through the Spetch Creek or Valentine Lake areas to be on the lookout for abandoned camping gear or clothing and missing people's posters were circulated in the small towns of Squamish, Whistler, Pemberton, Mount Curry, and D'Arcy. The Lilwat Nation assisted in the search. They know the mountain inside and out, said relative Mike Jett. They've gone on hikes themselves, searching for clues, and there are people that go berry picking and mushroom picking in the and around that area. Those people are going to be our best chance for finding something. As spring came in 2013, two and a half years after their unexplained disappearance, Whistler Pemberton, Royal Canadian Mounted Police spokesperson, Staff Sergeant Steve LeClaire, said they would be putting up new missing persons posters to remind hikers to keep an eye out for any signs of the couple's remains or their belongings. We're hopeful we find the remains at some point, he said. That might happen without people hiking in the area. The previous fall... Police had been searching the area again where their abandoned car had been found. Jonathan Jett's mother, Lisa Grenier Jett, said on unsolvedcanada.ca that they were supposed to come back to Jonathan's apartment in Vancouver. Someone calls us the 9th of September to tell us that Jonathan and Rachel, they never came back from their hike. Sometimes I ask myself if something happened to them on that Forest Service road. The police... Helicopters, search and rescues, dogs, they all searched for them for 10 days and they didn't find anything. Just the Jonathan's car packed on that road. Volunteers continued the last summer. We hired three pros who searched the ravines, the glaciers, and we did not find a single clue. I asked myself many, many questions. We don't know what happened in this incident, said RMCP LeClaire. The fact that two people went missing is very unusual. At the spot where Rachel's sunglasses were found, it's almost as if the missing couple were snatched up right there. Our goal is we want to establish direction of travel. Search organizers had said several times, why was it so hard to find out which way they had gone? I don't know. But again, two young people going for a hike just for a couple days in the backcountry. They're just gone. No traces. Nothing. 
No backpacks, no clothing found, no bones found, nothing. They just left their car on like a service road. I don't know. Again, I'm not saying it's paranormal. I'm not claiming that a Sasquatch, you know, abducted them. I'm not saying that. It could be serial killers. It could be lots of things. But something odd is happening. Again, it's always strange to me when experienced people go missing. And they're never seen from again. Their families, they had no problems. These weren't like someone who had a bad drug problem or they were criminals and they were laying low. Like these are people that had bright futures, something to do. Like we've talked about before with the missing hunters. These are people that had a whole family and they just went out one evening to come hunting and they had, had big plans for the weekend and they're never seen again, ever. I got another weird one. Check this out. In December, 1998, 23-year-old Matthew David Pendergast was in his last semester at Rhodes College in Tennessee. On the morning he disappeared, he'd been due at class, a distance of four blocks away from his apartment. He left his apartment in Memphis, Tennessee, but he never arrived at his class, and he was never to be seen again. That same day, his Toyota vehicle was found abandoned on a private levee near Bayou Meta Swamp, off Kerr Road in Lenoke County, Arkansas, just off Interstate 40. This area was private land reserved for duck hunters. One of the hunters who found the vehicle, a guy named Joe Murdahl, told Matthew's mother, Mary Ellen, that he and a friend had seen her son's SUV parked up there around 2 p.m. He said it had not been there when they'd passed the area at 10 a.m. that morning. They'd left a note on the windshield asking for the owner of the vehicle to move it. The next day, they saw that the vehicle was still there, and it was then that they looked inside for some sort of identification. The keys were still in the ignition, and it was unlocked. In the glove compartment, they found an old oil change receipt that had Matthew's parents' home phone number on it. The vehicle was unlocked, and the keys were inside. So, too, was the backpack he used for college. During a search of the area around the car the following day, his wallet, containing his driver's license, credit card, and $46 in cash was found inside his jeans pocket. This was approximately 100 yards from his abandoned vehicle in a wooded thicket. His clothes were also found in the woods, there in a pile. Blue jeans and a t-shirt, as well as his shoes and socks, but there was no sign of Matthew. He had seemingly driven way off course that morning driving approximately 125 miles, then turning off of the highway and driving down a private dirt road to a levee and a swamp. He'd then taken his shoes and all of his clothes off and vanished. Or so it would appear. By all accounts, his pants were wet from the knees down, as though he had stepped out of them and dropped them to the floor where he stood. Yet, they were found in a wooded area of thickets. Although his pants were soaking, according to one investigator on the scene, his t-shirt was as dry as if it had just come out of the dryer. Although it was winter, no jacket was found. Matthew was last seen leaving his residence in Memphis between 7.30 a.m. and 8 a.m. on December 1st, 2000, in his SUV, which had Georgia license plates. His landlady heard him moving around just before this. The previous evening, he had appeared in a play on campus. After that, back at his apartment, he called a friend in Atlanta to discuss what he would write in an upcoming college paper. His friend, Geo Presley Brooks, said he was upbeat when they talked. Early the following morning, he'd sent a text to the same friend saying, everything's all right, no problem, I'll talk to you later. Some wondered, did that message mean something more? Was it some kind of clue about what had happened to him? Or what he was planning to do. And yet, probably the most obvious answer is that he continued working on his planned college paper or run it through his mind the night before, after speaking to his friend, and was now sure how he would write the college paper, so he was just letting his friend know. Matthew was slim, five feet six inches. He played on the college soccer team and had wrestled at a private school he attended in Atlanta. He liked to play tennis. He ran track and cross country, he was sociable and well-liked. At college, he joined the Kappa Sigma fraternity. He enjoyed playing a multi-user Dungeons & Dragons game online called Threshold RPG. 
When his parents received the call from the two hunters about his ava- abandoned vehicle, they immediately began to coordinate a search from their home in Georgia. First, they phoned the college campus security. Security checked his apartment and then issued an email to all students asking for anyone who knew his whereabouts to contact them. Over the next few days, searches were carried out for the missing student at the bayou. Helicopters flew over the swamp and woods with night vision. Divers were sent out to enter the water with special sonar locating devices. And, of course, bloodhounds and cadaver dogs were brought in. The canine team picked up the young man's scent from the pile of clothes to the edge of the bayou meadow. The search focused on the thick woods and the water. The bayou meadow is a huge state-owned wildlife management area comprising of 30,000 acres. Much of it is flooded. The river is a complex waterway that winds through five Arkansas counties. Besides, the bayou is thick and wooded. Matt was never known as a camper or a hiker. He was a city kid. His parents and the investigators could see no obvious attraction or any reason for Matt to be out there. Strangely, although the dogs did pick up the young man's scent from the pile of clothes to the edge of the bayou meadow, the dogs found no scent to follow him from his vehicle to his clothes. There were also no footprints from his vehicle to the pile of clothes. Investigators also found no signs of a struggle, no weapons, nor any DNA evidence. How did this happen? The tracker dogs could only intermittently pick up on his scent, and some investigators even wondered if he had actually made it to the spot where his car and clothes were found. When his clothing was found, his mother expressed the opinion that it appeared to be possible that this was staged. She said that her son was not particularly neat and tidy and she couldn't imagine him placing his clothes down in such a nice and neat pile. His bedroom at home was notoriously untidy. She did not feel this was the work of her son. On the other hand, a very strange and commonality of suicidal victims who end up killing themselves by walking into rivers or the sea is often that they will strip naked and place their clothes on the shore in a very orderly, neat, and tidy pile before finally wading into the water. So, the question is, could he have taken his own life? Maybe. Although the divers found no body, he was also described as being upbeat during his phone call in the early hours before he disappeared. He had been in a play the night before and was planning a paper that was due to write. He was sociable. He had friends. and would seem to have no problems that could have led to him suicidally depressed. His mother said that he, you know, he was a little worried about the papers he had due to finish, you know, to finish up his degree, but other than that, he was in good spirits. He was an excited young man who was looking forward to graduating. He had plans of starting his own nonprofit organization to help those in need in third world countries. He was looking forward like he had a bright future. He did. He had a sense of direction and meaning of, with his life. If Matt were interested in some type of repeat or retreat, wouldn't he have gone to the mountains or somewhere else? Somewhere he'd have some knowledge of what to do? Why would he go to the bayou where he had little to zero experience? One strange clue, however, did leave investigators to contemplate suicide, so he can't rule that out. As already mentioned, when he was not studying or playing soccer or tennis... He took a lot of time enjoying playing interactive online fantasy games like Dungeons and Dragons. And on this online game, it had a curious link to something found in his abandoned car. He had a journal, and this was found inside Matthew's car, and it contained lots of poetry that he had written. The poems were contemplations on life and nature, and yes, death, with some entries describing the Silver Elves. He wrote about silver elves a lot and how they always seeked immortality and about walking into the water and becoming one with nature again. Now it's unclear what he meant in those writings, whether he was just being creative or literal. His parents said that there was no way he would simply walk into the water and drown himself. And yet, cryptically, the online game he played a lot had a link to a website called The Silver Elves. This was where the words he had written in his journal had come from. The link led to a website for a group called the Silver Elves. 
and featured the elven tree of life and death. After finding the journal, the Lanoke County Sheriff's Department decided to hire a psychic, a woman named Carol Pate, to help them out. Perhaps Matthew really had taken the twisted, treacherous journey to what he thought would lead to immortality by drowning his own body. The psychic claimed that he wanted to be rebirthed as a silver elf. The psychic said she saw Matt take off his clothes, fold them neatly, and step out into the bayou, where he died of hypothermia. In other words, he didn't drown himself, but simply passively laid down to die in the cold mud. She told KATV in a later interview that she believed Matthew felt that he was in a battle for his soul, that he was battling demons, and he lost. However, his mother and closest friends all said that he would never do a thing so crazy as to willingly wade into the water or the mud at a random spot off a highway and lay down to just die. His family didn't believe he would have taken his own life in any way, and there was also no evidence that he was ever a drug user. His friend Jason Woods told Memphis Magazine, talking about the journal entries that Matthew had made, he said that he wrote creatively about all aspects of life, Focusing on dark poems or fantastical ideas only sensationalizes and creates a nonsensical mystery. Give Matt privacy a thought and a modicum of respect. In other words, his friend's opinion was that it was ludicrous to suggest and and disrespectful to imply that Matthew would literally do anything he wrote in his journal. It was just poetry, not reality. That's what his friend at least believed. The authorities searched for a week, after his neat pile of clothes were found. Searchers came up with nothing, however. No clues at all to explain where Matt was. All they could do was try to come up with ideas and theories. Lowen Oak County Sheriff Investigator Jim Kulesa believed it was possible the clothes had been staged, and this could have been done in this case, given that Matthew's scent did not track from his vehicle to his clothing. But staged by who? And why? His parents had to wonder, had he been kidnapped? Yet, no ransom note ever came. The police suggested perhaps a carjacking, giving a ride to a hitchhiker that turned bad, or a drug deal gone wrong. But the student had no history whatsoever of criminal activity or with fraternizing with other criminals. The week-long search for him in the bayou came to nothing, despite the sonar divers, the helicopters, the canines, and eventually the case went cold. That was until 2013, when Matthew Mershon of KATV News announced that there was a possible break in the case. It came when a letter mysteriously sent to the Jacksonville Police Department. The letter named individually a group of people allegedly involving a missing person case. And the letter writer believed that these people could also have been involved in Matthew's disappearance. The original investigator, Jim Kulesa, and others of the Lowen Oak Police Department joined forces with Jacksonville Police Department to do more investigations. A number of people were interviewed, including, says Kalesa, an Elvis impersonator, but that didn't pan out, and neither did any of the other people questioned. In fact, many of the people listed in the letter had already passed away. The police say they believe the evidence is still out there, but that the witnesses have not shown themselves. Back during the original investigation, the lead investigator, Frank Sturdivant, was practically determined to try to solve the case. Tragically, his own son had died of drowning. When Memphis Magazine writer Marilyn Sadler went to his office, she could tell he followed every lead, no matter how small or irrelevant it might have seemed, desperate to find any clues. He did wonder, had Matt drowned himself in the bizarre pursuit of living as an immortal elf? but he also followed the work of a private investigator hired by the missing young man's parents. This private investigator, who insisted on anonymity, found the aspects of his wet up to his knee jeans very curious and rather suspicious. The drainage ditch between where his vehicle was found and where the clothes were found was filled with water that would have come up much higher than his knees. The private eye also discovered some very curious information about an incident that occurred three weeks after the student disappeared. He discovered that on December 28th, a trooper pulled over to check on a stationary Cadillac along the road close to where Matt had vanished from. 
the trooper, found himself growing suspicious because he noticed that the man standing beside the Cadillac appeared to be trembling uncontrollably. The trooper began to question the man, and as he was doing so, another man appeared, carrying a can of gasoline. The trooper thought perhaps the first man, who appeared to be the driver of the Cadillac, was shaking because he was cold. It was in the middle of winter, and he let them leave but noted down the license plate. What the private eye discovered was that after this, later in the day, the Cadillac returned and the driver broke into a house on the same road. It would seem for the purpose of using the telephone located in the house. When the owner of the house came home carrying groceries and opened the door, she screamed on seeing the intruder. The intruder, the Cadillac driver, said calmly to the person they were speaking to on the woman's telephone, I have to go. The lady of the house just came in. Then he opened the front door and left. But as he did so, the lady whose house he had just broken into noticed that in one of his hands, he was holding a cell phone. So why then, she wondered, had he broken into her house to use her phone? Now, once she was sure that he had gone, the owner of the house went to her phone and pressed redial to see what number the intruder had called. When the person on the other end answered the phone, it turned out to be a convenience store located in North Little Rock, not far from the location of her house. She handed the telephone number over to the private detective who ran a background check. He discovered that the worker who had answered the phone at the store had a serious criminal record. The driver of the Cadillac was also background checked, and in fact, only the next week after his home invasion, he was arrested in Phoenix, Arizona for the possession of marijuana and mushrooms. The Cadillac itself was owned by someone else, a drug runner and counterfeiter who lived in Atlanta. Very strangely, only three miles from a friend of the missing student. This friend had already been questioned by the police, said the private eye. And he, as well as the police, had had some suspicions about him. The private eye also emphasized how strange a coincidence it would be that in a large city like Atlanta, this friend and the drug dealer would live in such relative close proximity. The private eye told Memphis Magazine that it went further. There had been phone calls between the Cadillac driver and the friend of the missing student on December 3rd. The private eye couldn't shake the chances that this was evidence of some kind of drug deal that had been planned and that the missing student had been talked into helping out with the deal, and as a result, he found himself there in the bayou. The private eye reasons that the student could have found himself way in over his head and had a change of heart about participating and panicked, by which time everyone involved panicked and this tragically led to murder. The private eye thinks that the student's body could have been in the trunk of the Cadillac and they'd brought his body back to bury it in the bayou somewhere, or that his body had been hid in the bayou and the Cadillac driver had returned to get it and bury it elsewhere. Memphis Magazine followed up on this to do their own fact-checking. However, shed doubt on the private eye. They couldn't find anything. The private eye was reluctant and unwilling to reveal the telephone records for the supposed phone calls between the friend of the missing student and the Cadillac driver. The private eye, however, said this was to protect his source. Now, the original investigator, Detective Kulesa, told the reporter, however, that he could find no records of such phone calls existing. The missing student's parents, though, were more inclined to believe the private eye and called him tenacious and determined. Unfortunately, they too did not get any of the evidence in writing to confirm the private eye's version of what may have happened. Did the Cadillac driver have good reason to be shaking the day the trooper pulled him over to talk to him on the road so close to the bayou? Or, like the trooper originally thought, was he simply cold? Was there any correlation to the Cadillac? the house break-in, and the missing student? Or did Matt really think he wanted to wade into the water and become an immortal elf and live in another realm of reality? In 2013, the original investigator, Kalesa, said, information we received is that this was a carjacking. Does this mean it was entirely someone different to the uncontrollable shaking at calm Cadillac driver turned home invader? And yet, at the end of it, no arrests have ever been made. So, what happened to Matthew? They never found him. 
ever. No one's ever seen him. Now, I know that bayou is a very large area, of course. And the Cadillac, you know, returning and breaking into someone's house to use the phone, but yet holding a cell phone in their hands. And then, you know, knowing a friend of Matthew's, like it's something I smell foul play. I don't know. Again, these strange disappearances, they boggle the mind. I am very curious with serial killers and mysteries and things like that. I know you are too. Let's take a break. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. And we're back with Expanded Perspectives. Booyah. Uh, Man, the stories of missing people, missing hunters, whatever you want to do, whatever group you want to talk about, it is disturbing. 100%. I know a lot of people think it doesn't have anything to do with paranormal, that there's a reasonable explanation, but I don't know. Um, You recently just shared a pair of girls that went missing in Panama with me, Mm -hmm. and um, that was pretty pretty interesting, and there's a lot of scary things out there. And things that can happen to people. So when you're out and about, like, you got to be careful, right? This is one of those things that it's really unsettling. The more, like, I do one with the girls. Well, just any of the missing people, because without being really involved, and I know how popular true crime is and all of this stuff is now, there are uh, way more people missing that there are no leads on their case than you would, than it feels comfortable to know. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like you would like to think, I personally would like to think that, oh, we we figure out a lot of stuff like that. Now, there's a lot of them that people just vanished mysteriously and were found, you know, dead later. And they really have no no other information than that. Yeah, I know. It's uh, it's weird to think of today, but I mean, it's still a thing like it just it's unsettling. It's been, and it's a lot easier to track people now than it was, say, 50 years ago. Oh, yeah. I mean, people can – they can pull all kinds of metadata out of oh, your yeah. phone. Yeah. Um, some of those stories are truly scary. Speaking of scary, yeah. uh, we had the pleasure of doing a podcast with the Ducks Unlimited podcast uh, with Chris and Clay. They invited us months ago, and we just recently did it. It's going to be airing on the Ducks Unlimited podcast. If you guys are into hunting and stuff like that, I suggest you go over there and check it out. We shared some cool stories, and Chris actually shared a cool story with us about the Arkansinian in the mist. Yes. Give it a listen. Uh, you know, when I moved here from Indiana in like 2007, maybe 2008, um, moved to Memphis. And when I moved here, uh, just like you said, with the hunting access, it was a lot different where, I mean, I grew up in Indiana. I could, I knew farmers. I had access to all kinds of property. When I moved here, everyone's hunting in Arkansas. They're all hunting flooded timber. You know, a lot of it's private. The rice fields are private. But there's a ton of really good public waterfowl hunting in Arkansas. And so that was my target area. I was like, I'm going hunting flooded timber. You know, this is like the picturesque thing that I'd always imagined, you know, growing up in Indiana hunting. I'd never done it before. Well, I did it a few times. And then I got convinced a couple guys. Uh, One of them worked at DU, one of them didn't. um, One younger guy. And I was like, hey, you know what? Let's go walk into Bio de Vue. And Bio de Vue is, I want to say, don't quote me on this, like 13 to 15,000 acres of flooded timber when the water's on. And you can just park in a parking area and just walk into the flooded woods. The woods is flooded, you know, probably a little less than knee, knee high. Um, but it's this vast expanse of area. And so, and I'd been there a couple times, like I said, but I didn't really know what I was doing, you know, typically just trying to learn a new public area. And so I get these two guys and we drive to Bayou View. It's about an hour and a half from Memphis. We get up there at who knows, you know, we're leaving Memphis at 3, 3.30 in the morning get up there park there's not a whole lot of people there in the walk-in area the other people boating in we didn't have a boat so we take off walking and we just walk and walk and walk for i mean it felt like 10 miles in flooded knee-deep water but it was probably you know a mile in something like that where we were like all right i know where we are we are in perspective to you know the boat lanes and this and that and so we kind of picked our spot and we're all standing there we put our decoys down and before we even set out decoys, it's like something changed in that humidity in the air and the whole place just got socked in with fog. 
And this is it's fairly typical in, in December in Arkansas um, for those areas to be super, super foggy. And it got so bad that I, you could be standing within 15, 20 feet of someone and you can't see them. So the three of us, I'm like, hey, come over here, you know. And it, like you said, we're out in the middle of nowhere. We don't really know where we are. It's a little foggy. You know, I'm kind of a, you know, paranormal believer anyway. So I'm just like, you know, just kind of has has this vibe to it, seriously. And so we're all standing there and we are standing within 10 feet of each other and just kind of talking. And right out of the fog, you just hear water slosh one time and there's a guy standing within two or three feet of us. And nobody even says anything. You just kind of look up. And this guy is not carrying decoys. He's carrying a shotgun. He has a duck call around his neck. He's in like the tin cloth jacket that you didn't really see even at that time because now now everybody wants to rock the tin cloth because it's like old, you know, heritage stuff. You didn't see a lot of that. He's wearing canvas waders and he just walks right between us, not saying a word. And he gets about five, eight, ten feet away and he just disappears into the fog. And you don't even hear the water sloshing anymore. It's like he was just there. And then he wasn't. And the, the guy that I was hunting with, his name is Stephen Walker. I'll throw him out. He used to be a DU employee. Um, he just looks at me and he was just like, who is that? And we're and the other guy that was there, you know, he just, he just wide eyed and I'm standing there and we're just like, we just bust out laughing because we're like, oh my gosh, like that was the weirdest thing. It was like an old man dressed in an old gear with no decoys wandering by himself through Biomita carrying a shotgun, you know, just that was it. And so we referred to that experience as the Arkansinian in the mist that we think that that was actually like an old, the ghost of an old hunter that just cruised through the flooded timber. And we saw him for that split second. So now we're verifying that there is actually an Arkansinian in the mist at Bio Devito. There's something out there. <laughs> yeah, good. something so out I there. I have heard this story before, Chris. I do have to ask you, because I don't think I've asked you this before. Did the guy have an expression on his face? Did he look at you guys at all? No. No, and that was the thing. He never looked at us. No acknowledgement. He never even... He never acknowledged that we were there. We were kind of like in shock because he's like standing basically almost not shoulder to shoulder, but yeah, within five, three, five feet. And you're standing in knee deep water. Fighting distance. And he, you're within fighting he, distance of this thing. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. That's yeah. And everyone's holding 12 gauges. So yeah, it's, like, yeah, it's right. a little scary. Yeah. So you got to make sure. That, yeah. So no, I mean, there was no, he never, never looked at us, never made, paid us any attention. He just, he was almost like he knew where he was going and he was going whether we were standing there or not. So there we go. Very, very, very cool story, you know, and we even talked about on the podcast, if you listen to it on their end, uh, you'll hear us talking about the possibilities of, was that something that's replaying over and over and they mm -hmm. just happened to be standing there when the ghost of this old hunter came by? Or was it a real guy that was just really creepy? He was just feet away from them, dressed like a pioneer, with old canvas waders and you know, old shirt and stuff. I, I don't know. What did he see? But it's very odd to be trying to screw around with hunters with 12 gauges uh -huh, uh -huh. in the fog yeah. in the early morning, a mile into a swamp. In like the, yeah. You know what I mean? Like that doesn't sound like a good idea. Speaking of missing people, right? <laughs> like, speaking of missing people. That's, that's a good thing. That's how this goes. But we had a lot of fun over there and there yeah. was, there was some great guys. I uh, hopefully Those we get to do great. A podcast with them again. Uh, don't forget, folks, coming up is the live show. Mm -hmm. We've mentioned it before. Panther Island Brewery in beautiful Fort Worth. Uh, we're going to be doing some stories and sharing tales and lies and telling stories and goofing and laughing on with one yeah. another and taking pics and things like that. Uh, if, yeah. you have, if you live near the area, uh, go ahead and come on by. If you don't, look, we understand uh, we'll be doing more of these in the future. I know that a lot of people, you know, Christmas is coming, things like that. Look, we get it. Like, if we just appreciate y'all supporting us oh, any way yeah. you can. Yeah. If you can't come out to the live show, look, we totally, totally get it. Luke is about to lose his mind, but much like you've mentioned before in the show, once the lights get on him, I don't know, he may freeze up. Right it's now, it's going to be fun. Right now, he wants to be selling merch, like stickers and stuff. He <laughs> wants to be signing autographs, doing selfies. He's all about it. 
We're gonna we'll find out very soon if that's gonna go down. Uh, Halloween is coming up on Monday. Cam, do you have any Halloween plans with your granddaughter or anything? Uh, you guys taking her trick or treating? I, they're is doing Grump's all that gonna, this weekend, I believe. Is what they've kind of got. You know the way it always sure. runs. Now I know her mom and dad will take her trick or treating and do all that, and they'll probably come by. But I know that they're doing all that stuff. Grump said invited on that. That's I got that's you. all their stuff, and then they'll come by and see me later. I got you. Uh, what do you got planned uh, before you leave for your big hunt? Hunting. Well, you're not going to actually be hunting. Yeah. You're going to be filming I'll hunting. I'll be doing all the filming. I'll be hunting. Uh, like last week, like we talked about, I harvested a doe with the recurve last week. I'll be hunting some more before I leave. And then when I get back, I'll spend some time in there. If people want to see your filming skills, what was it, like Rock Slide TV or something? Yeah. Where can they go watch? You can go to YouTube right now and you can punch in a uh, search for the channel called Rock Slide, R-O-K. Uh, slide, S-L-I-D-E, all one word. Go there and you can look for a video called In Plain Sight. And it's about 40 minutes long. And it is, that's all the video and stuff that I'd put together on the last one and shot that movie. So if y'all want to go check it out and y'all haven't, you know, haven't heard. And Tony and Blake are on there. And of course yep. the person they're talking to when they're talking to the camera it is the cameraman is you. Yeah. You'll see me. There's one part of it where I put a little bit of me in there where they ask me a question, but otherwise, yeah, you wouldn't know it was me unless, unless I think at the you. end you could see our logo even. Yeah, I put the logo in it, and then, oh, there's two spots in it when I'm, there's a little outtake part where I'm actually doing some some field work, some medic work on Blake's hand where he cut himself with a broadhead. Yeah, you need to figure yeah. out a, way, a clever way to get those two involved with like a sticker or something where you can uh, feature it on their, right. uh, on their pickup truck or their bow case yeah. or something. You know, we want to work out like a sponsorship deal. Like, we're filming him, but you got to yeah. like endorse this product. Yeah, you got to put it on there. Hey, I got something I want to share with you, and I thought this was fitting especially right now, I like to always peruse through the BFRO and check stuff out and all that. Get a load of this this sighting. This is a Bigfoot sighting that happened in 2020 on October 23rd, okay? Mm-hmm. It took place in the state of Texas, Kyle. Okay. And it took big place state. in Parker County. Oh, now you got me interested. Because <laughs> right? this is where we're based, is Parker County. West of Weatherford, Texas, on the river itself. It says this. Hello, my name is Ricardo. And on February the 23rd, or on Friday, sorry, I'm sorry, Friday the 23rd of October, 2020, my wife and I were seeing if a restaurant here was open so we could have lunch. It was around 1 p.m. The name of the restaurant is called the Catfish Cafe, located just west of Weatherford on the Interstate 20, right next to the Brazos River. I know exactly where it is, right mm -hmm. by Hillbilly Haven. Yep, it's closed now. Hill, not Hillbilly Haven. The restaurant is. The restaurant's mm -hmm. no longer I know open. exactly it is, yep. Says there was only one worker at the restaurant, and he told us that the restaurant would not be open until 4. So the wife and I decided to drive around the countryside in that area to kill some time until 4. Immediately just west of the restaurant, about 50 yards or so, is a bridge that goes across the Brazos River. We headed across it and stopped in the center of the bridge to look at the river scenery when we spotted a huge dark figure on the river wading in the water ankle deep. This thing was about a quarter mile north from the bridge, and at first we thought it could be a man that was kicking the water, chasing a possible fish or something. But looking at the object a little closer, we knew it was not a man because it was dark, tall, and hairy. We believed that it was a Bigfoot looking for his meal. We stayed there on the bridge for a good five minutes as no cars were coming. As we drove around for a while after that and came back to the restaurant around 345, stopping again on the bridge to see if the thing was still there. It wasn't. And when we got our food to go and went back home to our house in Weatherford. Uh, so that was after that. And it says that you guys are the first people we've told about this incident. And it goes on. It says it was a solid color and it was dark and it was tall. Now, there's some other you know stories that we've covered that's taken place around and close mm -hmm. and whatnot. But... There's that one. Here's the thing. The last trip I took this year on the kayak, that's where I was at. Was that in that exact area? I know exactly. So I, I know it well. down through there. Yeah. So I've been all through that area. I know exactly where they're talking about. There may be some pictures that I've even got from me back there just about three or four months ago. So the, the, there's a main bridge, which is mm -hmm. Interstate 20. But if you exit off on an access road before that, there's actually an old Mm -hmm. metal bridge. And I think I've, you can go back on my Instagram feed from years ago. I have a black and white photograph you do, yeah. of the old bridge. Well, that's right there in that spot. I used to take the boys fishing down there all the time. And they'd fish for about 20 minutes and then end up just skipping rocks and playing in the water because the water, it's only about three feet deep at the deepest most of the time. Yeah, They let water out at PK 
flows all the way to Granberry, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, now, when it rains and stuff, yeah, it can get up and there'll be lots of debris. But that, what his story, I'm not saying we saw what he claims they saw. But it makes but sense. It makes sense. Yeah. Like, it's fitting, right? Yeah. So, very cool. I mean, if you're listening to this, please, we'd like uh, maybe to talk to you some more. Yeah. Maybe get down there and take some pictures. If stuff. you want to ever, I, I know it, uh, there's a place you can actually rent kayaks right in there. Oh, yeah, I know Brazos Rock Kayak Rental. You can go to Brazos Rock Kayaks, and you can rent kayaks. You can stay right there. That's the friends of ours, and that's where I launched from. And you can actually kayak and go right past this place with Bigfoot. I may have to go back down yeah, and look around. Yeah, we used to, as kids, we'd, re- we'd go to Rochelle's, mm-hmm. and we would we would go down three-day trips on the Brazos. Yep. And we'd, I mean, I never thought about Sasquatch spying on us while we were doing that. Never crossed my mind. Never crossed right? my mind, right? <laughs> Never crossed it, yeah. Countless times. <laughs> we need to do it again. It would be fun. You got to time it just right because you don't want to go when it's too hot because you're you don't be dragging yeah. the boat all the time, right? Like you want to. Right now would be a great time to go. What do they call it? Portaging? What do they call Portage. it? Yeah. yeah. You don't want to be doing that and in the 100 wanna, degree heat. I mean, that's not and any you fun. don't want to be down there in the spring because you don't want to get caught in the storms. <laughs> yeah, water moccasins <laughs> all over you. So, I remember distinctly a time that you, now that we're thinking about this. Uh oh. <clears throat> I might have to share, save some of this for the, the live show or the, another OTC, but I distinctly remember a time when we were all in the river and we were skipping rocks at each other's heads. <laughs> Do you remember that? And there was like rocks we were like head glitching behind. And yes. my parents were actually yelling at us yeah. to stop. But I remember saying we weren't afraid of getting hit in the teeth because that was the big thing <laughs> because we had them under the water. <laughs> remember, the only thing that was above the water was like your nose and your eyes and the top of your head. I don't even try to remember who it was. It was my little brother, you. I think it was Cody. When Cody maybe, there? Maybe. I don't know. Just doing stupid stuff. And now you look at it, you're like, why were we skipping rocks at each other's it's the same faces? same reason we used to shoot bottle rockets at your little brother. Yeah, because it's fun. Yeah. Right? Dude, and he had some moves. That son of a gun, he, he missed his calling for being acrobatic the way he was dodging rocks and bottle rockets. Well, he's a fireman now. Yeah. Maybe that comes in handy. That it probably does. Right? Uh, hey, if don't you panic. Ha- <laughs> if you have any stories you'd like to share with me and Cam, please don't hesitate. You can email the show. I know we get... We get emails from people asking if that's the place to email us. This is we only got one email, folks. <laughs> you want to send the story in written form, you got to send the email to expanded perspectives at yahoo.com. If you feel like calling it in and telling it, 888-393-2783. We like to hear y'all tell it too. Absolutely. I but love, if y'all like to hear us tell it, we get it. Yeah, I, I totally get it. We just want to we'll, hear the we'll, stories. We'll mispronounce sure. wherever y'all are from. We'll mispronounce whatever y'all, road y'all saw it on. That's just how we do it. We It's just because we're dumb. No, and I know we have a lot of new listeners, so there's people from time to time that are new, and they don't know that we mispronounce stuff, so they're trying to set us straight. But like, if I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times, you don't need to correct us. <laughs> I mean, wanted- most of the time we're doing it on purpose. Sometimes we're not. Either way, don't care. Yeah. It's better that y'all don't know. Yeah, it makes it funny, right? We're here to have fun. We're not so, why is everybody going to be so serious when you're talking about cryptids or something? Have yeah. a good time. Speaking of good time, if you want to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition and just one scoop of water every day, then Athletic Greens makes it easy. They're going to give you free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is go to athleticgreens.com slash expanded. Boy, you sure flowed into that one pretty smooth with the AG1 and all that stuff, the way it flows into my belly every morning. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. And also, don't forget about Microdose. Microdose is available nationwide. To learn more about microdosing THC and do it every day, just like me and Cam, you got to go to microdose.com and use the promo code EXPANDED to get free shipping and 30% off your first order. And last but not least, if you want to get access to hundreds of new shows, you got to go to expressvpn.com slash expanded right now, and you can get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. That's expressvpn.com slash expanded. That's about all the time we have for this episode. I hope everyone out there has a wonderful and happy Halloween, whether you're trick-or-treating or partying. Please be safe. Uh, I'm Kyle. He's Kim. Peace, y'all.